Hello. And welcome to the Camden Public Library's regular Friday program, Friday Explorations Read Aloud. My name is Joseph Cote. And for our 194th program, it is a pleasure for me to be your host. The 2011 David Gamel Legend Award, winning American author of The Way of Kings, Brandon Sanderson, once shared his thoughts that, quote, the purpose of a storyteller is not to tell you how to think, but to give you questions to think about. Over the centuries and the decades of written and recorded history, storytellers have played so key a role in recording the sense and the sensibilities of the times, as well as giving us the questions to think about as civilization has moved forward. As we all know, storytellers are of a varied lot, cutting across all cultures in all parts of the world in all periods in history. Poets have played and continue to play a significant role in the recording of history through storytelling traditions from ancient to contemporary times. The thinking of the times is oftentimes most precisely and concisely presented in poetry, from the epic poems of Homer to the romantic sonnets of Shakespeare, to the traditional 17 syllables of haiku. Terry Tempest Williams, American author, educator, conservationist and activist refers to storytelling as, quote, the oldest form of education. Fortunately, poetry exists throughout the history of man and the natural world of which we humans are so integral a part of and is often the key subject of focus. Today's gem of a book in the spotlight offers us a rare look at how nature, and especially the seasons of the year, played so integral a role in a specific historical period in a specific country. The key season of focus is winter of which we Mainers already begin to sense coming soon, even now in August. <laughs> and the period is a key one in the history of England, the Anglo-Saxon period from 450 to 1066 AD. Key because of the transition from paganism to Christianity. At the start of the period in the fifth century, the people of Anglo-Saxon England were predominantly pagan. It was over the course of the early seventh century that they converted to Christianity. The prominent role in the conversion was given to the mission from Rome by Pope Gregory I, which arrived in Kent, southeastern England in 597. The records of this significant era were carefully kept, much in poetic form, as early as 725 by English monk, author, and scholar by the name of Bede, B-E-D-E, -D -E, also known as Saint Bede and Bede the Venerable. In his book, The Temporum Rational, The Reckoning of Time, Bede led a learned discussion of the calendar and the principles by which time was calculated based mainly on the weather changes and the seasons of nature. 
winter played the most significant role as evidenced by the writings, especially the poetry of the period. As a matter of fact, it was common to count time by winters, to speak, for instance, of someone having lived a certain number of winters in the world. Even after the fusion, then transition from paganism to Christianity, with the combining of yearly festivals, the calendar based on the seasons with winter in the pivotal center proved remarkably durable and lasting, not unaltered, but essentially stable for many hundreds of years. The sixth century of Anglo-Saxon history saw huge political and cultural change but some things remained constant. The year turned from midwinter to midsummer. The length of the days waxed and waned. Fields were sown and harvested. Scholars found methods for reckoning the passing of years. Poets found words to praise it. And everyone lived the cycle together in their different ways year by year. Even in the late years of the Anglo-Saxon period, leading up to the Norman conquest and the end of the period in 1066, enlightened manuscripts such as the epic poem Beowulf and the Exeter book joined in 1040 by the Menologium, a poem about the cycles of the year, and Maxime's Two, a poem focused on the passage of time in the seasons. All of these were dominant records of the thinking of the times. The capture of the poetry of this significant age in one small book was achieved in 2022 with the publishing of Winters in the World, a journey through the Anglo-Saxon year. And the talented author of that book in the spotlight today is Eleanor Parker. As London's Guardian newspaper praised at the time of publication, quote, Eleanor Parker's prose is as lyrical as the poetry that she so deftly translates. This lovely book acts as a portal back to an older time, using the poetry of medieval England to unlock a world where the seasons and the changing weather are a subject of deep pleasure and renewing wonder. Before exploring the Anglo-Saxon poetry of the seasons, let us consider some few facts about the author, Eleanor Parker. Eleanor Catherine Parker is a British historian and medievalist. She studied Old and Middle English and Old Norse literature at the University of Oxford. She is a lecturer since 2022 in medieval English literature at Brasenose College, Oxford University. She was previously a Mellon postdoctoral fellow at the Oxford Research Center in the Humanities. Parker is a columnist for the esteemed publication History Today, which is where I found her. <laughs> In May 2018, she published her first book, Dragon Lords, The History and Legends of Viking England. Her second book, Conquered, The Last Children of Anglo-Saxon England, was published in 2022 and was selected by the London Times as one of the best books of that year. 
remarkably, this, her third book, Winters in the World, A Journey Through the Anglo-Saxon Year, was also published in 2022. <laughs> Amazing. The book has been described by British academic, journalist, and biographer Catherine Hughes as a, quote, magical exploration of the weather literature left behind by the poets, scientists, and historians of Anglo-Saxon Britain. Recognized for his writing about the world's faiths, especially Christianity, Christopher Howes praised the book as, quote, fascinating and authoritative. And Charlie Connolly, English author of popular nonfiction books, has written of the books as a beautifully written account, which transports us through each season in a deeply sensual manner. It was selected by Dominic Sandbrook writing in the London Times as one of the 25 best history books of 2022. And by Michael Wood as one of the 21 best books for history lovers in BBC History Magazine. Writers of Winters in the World, a journey through the Anglo-Saxon year. A little more need be said perhaps, but if the airless, sultry, humid summer leaves you longing for autumn or indeed for anything other than never ending broil, you could do no better than plunge into the Anglo Saxon year. Here, the seasons are properly seasonal and wispy autumn smoke, blustery spring mornings, and a summer that is lush, green, and gently generative. Pride of place, though, goes to winter. The hoary frosted iron earth season of unyielding chill. Glorious. <laughs> Author Eleanor Parker conjures up this evocative magic from her careful reading of the wealth of weather literature left behind, as I mentioned, by the poets, the sermonizers, the scientists, and the historians of Anglo Saxon Britain period that stretched, as a reminder, from 450 to 1066. This means 600 summers and winters to think and write about. Combing the texts of everyone from the anonymous author of Beowulf to the Christian chronicler Bede, Parker paints a glowing picture of an age when the revolving year not only filled up the senses, but intricately marked out time and meaning. Races of scholars were engaged in computus, the science of deciding just when the new year should begin and what happened to the solstice in a leap year. Parker's larger point is to show how older ways of experiencing the seasons continue to run steadily through our lives, even if we don't quite register the tug. In my humble opinion, dear Mother Nature continues to prove her strength and her power by tweaking the seasons we once knew so well, and unfortunately wreaking havoc in all sorts of ways in all sorts of places on planet Earth. Eleanor Parker scanned the Latin, French, and finally English writings of 600 Anglo-Saxon winters to write her book. Most striking to me always in any culture in the world at the time is the connection of the people to the natural world. The First Nations of the North American continent 
give us the very best example of that symbiosis and that respect for all things in nature. I found it absolutely fascinating that similar connection in the fifth century and the Anglo-Saxon cultures of England, a true connection to nature. Well, winter is the center of focus of this book, obviously. And I'm going to begin actually on page 41 and talk mostly and read poetry, uh, particularly from um, that uh, particularly large chapter which she dedicates to winter. And then uh, just not to depress you <laughs> with winter as I read for today's program in the middle of August, I'm going to select a poem and a small description of it from each of the other three seasons, not much, just a little bit, to show you that she's done her work here. She's done her work and how the predominance of winter poetry um, uh, is very significant, but that the other seasons also play such an important part. So allow me to begin with winter and then I shall hop around. Anglo-Saxon poetry is full of winters. Snow, hail, frost, and ice set the characters of many Old English poems. And it's clear that this season appeals strongly to the imagination of Anglo-Saxon writers. The poetic language and imagery of winter exhibit many consistent features that recur again and again in very different stories and very different contexts. Let's start with the Menologium, the calendar poem which moves through the cycles of the natural and the liturgical year. According to the system of reckoning used in this poem, winter runs from 7 November to 6 February from a few days after All Saints' Day until just after Candlemas. And pointing out that this manuscript was written after the transition had begun to Christianity. So combining the festivals of the pagan period uh, to the festivals of the Christian period, um, smoothly fused, uh, but uh, still existing side by side. The first day of winter has its own name, Winter's Deg or Winter's Day, and its arrival is described in language we'll start to recognize as characteristic of Anglo-Saxon poetry of winter. Quoting here, after All Saints Day comes Winter's Day far and wide, six nights later and seizes sun bright autumn with its army of ice and snow, fettered with frost by the Lord's command so that the green fields may no longer stay with us, the ornaments of the earth. I love that choice of verb, seizes, winter seizes, sun bright autumn. Great choice of word. The description of winter in this poem, brief as it is, has remarkable force. Winter is imagined as an invading warrior, a conquering king who sweeps through the earth with the fierce blasts of his snow army and takes the earth prisoner in his fetters of frost. This poem finds beauty in almost everything about the turning year, and it extols the exuberance of spring, the warmth of summer, the plenty of autumn. But here all the beauty belongs to what's lost when winter takes hold. We have a last glimpse of the loveliness of the abundant harvest, sun bright autumn, then winter violently seizes it and puts the earth in chains. The poet plays with the mournful contrast between two similar sounding words, contrasting the green summer fields adorned, fettered, 
fretted with beauty and the winter fetters of frost. Imagery of winter imprisoning or changing the earth appears across the old English poets. Corpa and its way of thinking that shapes not only the poet's imagination of winter, but also their description of the coming of spring when these chains are loosed and the earth is set free. As earth is trapped by winter, so are human beings. This metaphorical language and imprisonment partly evokes the literal restraints winter imposes on human and natural activity. Winter weather keeps people indoors and stops them from traveling, and plants can't grow. But in many poems, the language is also used to explore other forms of constraint and oppression, psychological as well as physical. We see this, for example, in the poem Andreas, which includes a short but powerful passage describing a winter snowstorm. Snow bound the earth in winter tumults. The skies grew cold with hard hail showers and ice and frost. Hoary battle marches locked up the homeland of men, the dwellings of the people. The lands were frozen with cold and chilly icicles. The force of the waters was shrunken. Across the river currents, ice built a bridge, a dark sea road. <laughs> Some wonderful choices of words there. There's something in all of this about the overwhelming power of winter and the helplessness of humans to do anything more and patiently endure it. That meant winter was a metaphor to which an Anglo-Saxon poet might turn when trying to evoke a mood of powerlessness, the sense of being trapped by forces beyond one's control. In a moving poem called Dior, a poet suffering loss in his own life tries to find consolation in his troubles by looking to past stories of suffering, the tragedies and griefs of famous men and women from Anglo-Saxon heroic legend. One story he tells is that of Wieland, a mighty smith of superhuman power and skill. Legend has it that Wieland was trapped on an island by a cruel king who wanted to exploit his gifts forcing him to make weapons and treasures. His hamstrings cut, Wieland could not escape until he constructed a magical suit of wings he used to fly away, exacting terrible revenge on his captor as he went. During his time of imprisonment, Dior says, Wieland endured winter cold misery. At the literal level, Wieland suffering had nothing to do with winter, and yet the phrase winter cold misery calls the reader's mind to this familiar association between winter and imprisonment. Wieland's lonely bitter life in captivity is a winter of the spirit. The only consolation Dior can offer is its refrain repeated after each story of suffering, quote, that passed away, so can this. Perhaps that's all that could be hoped for in winter too, that with the passage of time, its hardships will come to an end. There are many more examples we could look at, far more than there's space to discuss here. An especially interesting one features in a poem called Solomon and Saturn, which imagines a debate between a pagan named Saturn and wise King Solomon. It's a kind of riddle contest in which Saturn challenges Solomon with a series of questions about the nature of the world 
and Solomon provides cryptic and often puzzling answers. The text is difficult and obscure, but by any standard, Saturn's questions are unanswerable. Why are earthly goods distributed unequally? Why do sorrow and laughter live so close together? Even when the questions are about nature, they reflect the sense that the world is a mysterious and unfathomable place governed by forces beyond human control. At one point, Saturn questions his wise interlocutor about a strange and terrible force of chaos, a mighty creature who travels through the world, destroying and devouring, causing grief wherever it goes. All things are helpless before it, and every year it consumes thousands of living creatures. This horror, Solomon answers, is age, which has power over everything on earth. He elaborates on its destructive power, describing age as if it is a giantess on a rampage. She uproots trees and smashes branches, gobbles up birds, gnaws iron with corrosive rust. And Solomon concludes, after this catalog of devastation, she consumes humans, too. She does the same to us. This riddling speech figures the passage of time and the process of aging as universally destructive. So it seems natural that Saturn's next question should be about another oppressive force closely linked to time, winter. I quote, but why does the snow fall, hide the ground, conceal the shoots of plants, bind up fruits, crush and repress them so that they are for a time shriveled with cold? Very often, too, he puts many wild beasts to the taste, test. He builds a bridge over the water, breaks the city gate, proceeds boldly on plunders. At this point, a large portion of text is lost in the manuscript. So if Solomon was able to give an answer to this question about winter, well, it's been lost. Snow and ice, like age, are personified as violent forces of destruction. And once again, the images of winter as an invading warrior, subduing the earth to its power. Ice, as in Andreas, builds a bridge over the water. And it's as if winter, attacking the earth, is besieging a fortified city. It breaches the moat of the fortress with its causeway of ice, breaking through the walls and bursting in, stealing and plundering at will. Winter is imagined as crushing and repressing the life within the earth, painfully forcing back any shoots of growth. That sense of oppression is echoed by several old English poems, which use winter to explore human grief and sorrow. Reflecting on how suffering can have a numbing effect on the spirit, like snow on the frozen earth, Perhaps the most poignant instance is a poem in the Exeter book I mentioned earlier called The Wanderers, in which an exile mourning the loss of home and friends is trapped in a winter which is his own grief. There is now none living to whom I dare openly speak the thoughts of my mind I truly know it is a noble virtue among warriors for a man to bind his spirit chest fast, conceal his heart, whatever he may think. The weary mind cannot withstand a word, nor the troubled heart provide help. So those eager for glory often bind fast sorrowful thoughts in their breasts, 
and I have had to keep my mind often wretched, deprived of homeland, far from kinsmen, fastened in fetters. Since long ago, I buried my Lord in the darkness of the earth, and from there journeyed winter sorrowful over the binding waves. He who has experienced it knows how cruel sorrow is as a companion for him who has few beloved friends. The path of exile holds him, not twisted gold, a frozen spirit, not the glory of the earth. It's an absolutely fascinating take on winter as it reflects sorrow and grief. And word, W-Y-R-D, I meant to explain earlier, is an old English word meaning basically the passage of time. So as time continues to move, so that line is the weary mind cannot withstand word, so cannot withstand the passing of time. In this poem, winter gets into your very heart. I agree. Despite, deprived of his lord and home, the lonely speaker describes himself as winter sorrowful, as desolate as winter, and he has a frozen spirit. Though not literal imprisonment like that of Wieland and St. Andrew, it's a painful claustrophobic enclosure the earth trapped beneath its winter covering is like the aching heart concealed in the grieving warrior's breast, which strains at its enforced silence. This is what it's like to face winter alone without the consolation of Bede's Mead Hall, where everyone in winter simply drank the winter away. It's exactly that kind of convivial society and the company and protection it offers for which this speaker is mourning. He describes journeying alone across the icy sea, falling asleep and walking to the cries of seabirds, which for a moment he mistakes for the voices of his lost friends. The winter landscape reflects the agonizing stasis of his emotional condition. Though he travels, he doesn't seem able to hope for change or improvement or the coming of spring. All he can feel in the midst of his grief is the pain of what he has lost. This is winter chill, numbing and enervating, forcing back even the expression of emotion, freezing the spirit. It's echoed by another poetic link between a winter and suppressed human emotion that features memorably in Beowulf. In a short narrative recounted within the main story, a, distinct, a distinctive feature of Beowulf is that it contains many allusions to other legends of kings and heroes from early medieval Northern Europe which are woven into the story around the main narrative strand of Beowulf's adventures. At one point, Beowulf and his men listen in the Mead Hall as the poet sings the tragic story of a long again feud, a long ago feud, between Frisians and Danes. It begins with Hildebuth, a Danish woman married to Finn, king of the Frisians who becomes caught in the middle of conflict between her husband and her brother, Hanif. While Hanif and his Danish companions are visiting Finn and Hildebur at their home, Finnsborough, they're set upon by the Frisians. And in the battle that follows, Hanif and Finn's son are both killed. Hildeberth has to lay her brother and son together on the same funeral pier, her ties to both sides of the feud bringing her double grief. After Hanif's death 
command of the Danes passes to a man named Hengus. War-weary and depleted on both sides, the Frisians and Danes make peace, swearing oaths that they will not seek vengeance for past injuries. But the truth cannot last. The feud breaks out again. Hengus avenges Hainifs by killing Finn, and the mounting Hildeberth is carried back to her homeland. The audience of Beowulf may have known this story well, since Hengus may be the man identified in legend as the founder with his brother, Horsa, of the Jutish kingdom of Kent. According to medieval tradition, one of the first Anglo-Saxon settlers in Britain and an ancestor of Ethelbert of Kent and his daughter, Ethelbert, with whom he began. If there's any truth in that, it would situate the events of the story around the middle of the fifth century. In Beowulf, the story provides the context for an incredibly claustrophobic winter scene set in the weeks after Hainif's death. Hengus and other survivors of the battle are still staying with Finn, choosing not to leave as winter weather comes on. As part of the peace treaty, they have all sworn oaths not even to speak of the recent conflict, but beneath their silence, the memory is fresh. It is a slaughter-stained winter, and the turmoil of the weather reflects Hengist's tormented mind. Till Hengus stayed with Finn, their slaughter-stained winter ill-fated. He brooded on his homeland, though he could not drive on the sea his ring-proud ship. The ocean seethed with storms, battled against the wind. Winter locked the waves in icy bonds until another spring came in the dwellings, just as it does now still, the gloriously bright weathers which unchangingly follow their appointed seasons. Then winter was past, fair the face of the earth. The exile was anxious to go, the guest out of these dwellings. He thought more readily of avenging his wrongs than the sea voyage and whether he could find some occasion for violence. Hmm. As in other poems we've looked at, Hengist's freedom of action is constrained by winter. The constraint is internal as much as external. Stormy seas and the raging winds seem to imprison him temporarily at Finsburg, but they also mirror his surging grief and his aching desire for vengeance, seething away beneath the silence imposed by the truce. If he had got away from Finsburg at once, perhaps the frail peace could have held, but the enforced inaction of winter gives him time to brood on his wrongdoings. By the time spring comes and he's free to go, the longing for vengeance has taken control of him. He stays and bloodshed breaks out again. There's an extraordinary emotional intensity in Hengist conflicted feelings here. His eagerness to escape from the place where he has fought and suffered contends with the brooding anger that is gaining mastery over him. Though the poet tells the story in a brief elliptical way, what comes across powerfully is the push and pull of Hengist's warring impulses, buffeting against each other with the force of clashing waves in a winter sea. The poet sets all that turbulent human emotion in juxtaposition with something very different, the ordered, impassive changing of the seasons. This is one of a number of moments in Beowulf where the poet turns to the seasons to explore some of the more abstract philosophical concerns of the poem. 
including an interest in power, history, and God's interventions in the world. Here, as we'll again see later, the turning of the seasons acts as a reminder that even in this poem about mighty heroes and kings, there are many things in the world that humans just can't control. The great warrior Hengist may be striving to take command of his emotions, but he can't influence the weather, the seas, or the passage of time. He cannot escape. The seasonal setting is also a means of exploring continuity between past and present, thinking about time on a larger scale. To the Anglo-Saxon poet, the world of Beowulf is already far in the distant past, and the time of Hengist is even further back in history. The subject of legend for Beowulf and his contemporaries just as Beowulf is for the poet and his audience. But one thing that connects them all, even to us, I might parenthetically add, and links, oh, and links them with us, is the passage of the seasons. The same. The cycling seasons the poet imagines Hengist living through, impatient and restless, are the same as in his own time. As winter passes, another spring comes to the dwellings just as it does now still, quote. The language moves into the present tense and Hengist's swirl seems suddenly less distant. It didn't. In Hengist's day, in Beowulf's and in ours, the seasons are a constant. Whatever else changes, whatever humans may be suffering in any particular winter, the year keeps turning. And one final little section on winter here. The connections are amazing, I think. The idea of winter that emerges from all these disparate poems is remarkably consistent. This, this season oppresses and constrains human beings in mind and body with a power almost too much for the winter heart beat. Not all characterizations of winter in Anglo-Saxon poetry are so negative though. Winter may offer evocative ways of thinking about human suffering, providing metaphorical language with which to evoke the storms of emotional turmoil or the chilling stasis of grief. But it offers other things too. And Anglo-Saxon poets were not incapable of seeing beauty in winter. It can be a time of transformation when a familiar landscape may be rendered suddenly alien by a blanket of snow. A flooded field can be turned into a spreading lake or a flowing river can change its nature and become frozen and immobile. These transformations are deeply strange, and in their suddenness, they may seem something more than natural, more like a miracle than a simple process of the weather. The wisdom poem Maximus I, from the Exeter book, muses on some of these transformations. Frost must freeze. Fire burn up wood, the earth grow, ice build ridges, water wear a helmet, wondrously locking up shoots in the earth. One alone shall unbind the frost's fetters. God, most mighty, winter must pass Good weather come again, summer bright and hot. Obviously written uh, after the uh, transformation or the change from paganism to Christianity. There's the familiar image of the frost's fetters 
in that poem. But nonetheless, there is a more positive in, uh, image of winter that we've seen so far. It not only promises that the season will, must end, turning again as everything in the year turns, but also finds something wondrous in winter itself. These lines describe a range of natural processes showing how elements act out their nature and fill their place in the divinely ordained structure of things. Like Maxim's too, with its catalog of animals and the habitats where they belong, this kind of wisdom poetry seeks to understand the world as ordered and patterned. Everything has a place and function, including frost and fire. But then there's also an interest and delight in mutability and change, how winter turns the natural world into something unlike its usual self. Ice becomes an engineer, building bridges where none have been before. Water wears a new helmet as if temporarily in disguise can mean a war helmet or any other kind of head covering, like a crown. Here, the conventional image of the chaining of the earth seems less like a threat than another marble. It's as if the concealment of growing plants within the ground is a magic trick, a token of unseen creative power. The shoots are hidden for a while, like a rabbit in a hat. But they'll spring forth again in time as they had never been as they had never been gone. Winter is full of surprises. God is in command of it all, poems suggest, and since he can be trusted to set the earth free from imprisonment in time, it's possible to imagine, to marvel at these wonders without fearing that winter will never end. There was a wonder on the wave, water turned to bone. The solution to this riddle must be some kind of ice, though it's debatable precisely what form is being imagined. Iceberg or icicle, both seem possible answers. The comparison between ice and bone conveys the whiteness and the smooth texture of ice, as well as its paradoxical combination of toughness and fragility. Ice is hard, but also like the bones of the human body, all too easily broken. And I'm going to um, end with just two short paragraphs from um, a final poem about winter. Um, and to proceed that, let me say that uh, many of the poems in the old English rune poem, a uh, very famous uh, poem of the period, uh, all of the runes have names. They're not just letters, also represent words. Each verse of this poem provides a riddling description of the idea denoted by the rune. Many of these relate to the natural world, sea, sun, horse, while others are objects used in human society, bow, gift, porch, or more abstract concepts, necessity, joy. A number are named for trees, including the oak, the ash, and the thorn. Two are about winter weather. Let us choose those two. Two are about winter weather, describing the runes, Hegel, H, Hegel, and Ease, with an I. So again, we're going down the alphabet, and these two, side by side, are about winter, from the Old English rune poem. And we start with the letter of the rune. Hail is the whitest of grains. It whirls down from the air of the sky. Gusts of wind toss it about. Afterwards, 
it turns into waste. And the second one, eyes, spelled I-S. Mm -hmm. We begin the short poem with the letter I. Ice is very cold, immensely slippery. It glistens glass clear, most like a gem, a floor wrought by frost, fair to behold. Well, let us move out of winter just briefly in the time remaining on our program, and let's do one poem from each of the other seasons. Even though there was a predominance of thought and action and poetry writing about winter during that period, of course, I want to make the connection to geographically where we are. In the north of England, winter is pretty rough and tumble. Um, so obviously all of this interest in winter would never have happened in another part of the world where winter was not so significant. So we are on that latitude not far off from northern North America and not far off from the northernmost point of America here in Maine. <laughs> so the chapter four is the coming of spring. Let us read something quickly from there. As we've seen in Anglo-Saxon poetry, winter is often imagined as a season when the earth and human beings are imprisoned, kept captive, by the fetters of frost. Naturally enough then, spring is associated with images of liberation and freedom once these fetters are released. The end of winter is envisioned in terms of thawing snow. Everything is free again and the waters run. So with that thought in mind, let us go to an Anglo-Saxon poem of the period that is prefaced by these two lines. Springtime energy is powerfully expressed in a poem from the Exeter book known as The Seafarer, which links spring with an eager, restless longing to travel, to search for new things and a new life. The seafarer begins with a winter scene, which will now be familiar from the poems we've already looked at, especially The Wanderer. The speaker has been out at sea, suffering from harsh weather, and he promises to tell us about the hardships he's encountered on his voyage. So a tad bit of whining starts us out here. I can sing a true song about myself, speak of virtue, virtue, Go and journeys, there we go. Speak of journeys, how I have often suffered in days of struggle, times of hardship. Bitter heart sorrow I have experienced, found in a ship many places of trouble, the terrible tossing of the waves where often the anxious night watch held me at the prow when it crashes by the cliffs. Part one. All the discomfort of a winter journey is vividly described, yes, indeed. His feet are frozen with frost. He's uh, beset by showers of hail, and he's so isolated that the only voices he hears are those of seabirds. So we continue on with a bit more whinging here, as we say in England, <laughs> whinging. There I heard nothing but the roaring of the sea, the ice cold waves. Sometimes the song of a swan became my pleasure and the cry of a gannet and voice of the curlew instead of the laughter of men, the singing of the seagull instead of mead drinking. Storms beat the stony cliffs there where the turn called, icy feathered. Very often the eagle cried back, feathers dripping. Ah, dripping, melting, spring coming. The force that compels him is described with extraordinary intensity. Now the thoughts of my heart clamor that I should strive myself with the high seas, the tossing of salty waves. My mind's hunger at all times urges my spirit to travel, that I, far from here, should seek the land of strangers. Indeed, there is no man on earth so proud-hearted, so generous of his possessions, 
so keen in his youth, so brave in his deeds, nor so loyal to his lords that he does not always have anxiety in his sea voyage about how the Lord will treat him. His mind is not on the harp, nor the giving of rings, nor pleasure with a woman, nor joy in the world, nor anything at all but the tumult of the waves. He always has a longing who sets out of the sea. So there's a movement forward, obviously, in that section as we move toward melting. The final section, the longing is explicitly linked in the coming of spring. The woods take on blossoms, towns become fair, meadows grow beautiful, the world hastens on. All these things urge the eager mind, the spirit to the journey. In one who thinks to travel far on the paths of the sea, the cuckoo, too, gives warning with mournful voice. Summer's watchman sings, foretells sorrow bitter in the breast. So now my spirit soars out of the confines of the heart, my mind over the sea flood. It wheels wide over the whale's home, the expanse of the earth, and comes back to me eager and greedy. The lone flyer cries, incites the heart to the whale's way, irresistible across the ocean's floods. So to me, the joys of the Lord are warmer than this dead life lent on land. He's still a pretty pessimistic dude, but uh, <laughs> at least he's moving in the right direction. Blossoming summer. Let's read something shorter from summer. Summer. In Anglo-Saxon calendars, runs from 9 May till 6 August. Oh my gosh, summer would be over by now. This is how the Menologium, that other manuscript I spoke of, describes its arrival, sketching the coming of May and then, close behind it, summer itself. On one May comes to the city sweeping swiftly, blended in its adornments of woods and plants, beautiful primalized to the dwellings. May brings many benefits everywhere among the multitudes. On the same day, those noble companions, Philip and James, brave things, gave up their lives for love of the Lord. And two nights afterwards, God revealed to blessed Helena the noblest of trees, on which the Lord of the angels suffered for love of mankind, the measurer on the gallows by his father's will. And after a week, minus one night, summer brings sun-bright days to the dwellings for mankind with warm weathers. Then the meadows quickly bloom with blossoms and joy mounts up throughout the earth among many kinds of living creatures. In manifold ways, they speak the praise of the king, extol the glorious one, the almighty. Obvious there was the mention of Easter there, uh, which would have, of course, then meshed into the pagan calendar. It would have been one of the holidays, obviously, uh, from the Christian calendar that would have been fused into the pagan calendar uh, seemingly rather easily and seemingly in short order, according to our uh, Eleanor Parker here, um, which I can't imagine that happening to Jay, bless our hearts. And then I'm going to read something from Summer and then a final chapter. So about Summer, without any prelude. At that time, the flesh becomes born again, entirely renewed thundered from sins, somewhat like how in harvest people carry home the fruits of the earth for sustenance, pleasant nourishment before winter comes in the reaping time, lest the showers of rain destroy them beneath the clouds. There they find sustenance, joy in feasting, when frost and snow with overwhelming force wrap the earth in winter garments. From those fruits shall grow again the blessed plenty of men, according to the nature of the grain, which first is sown as pure seed when the sun's light 
life's sign in spring wakes the world's wealth so that these fruits, according to their own nature, are born again, ornaments of the earth. At a closing chapter from Eleanor Parker, closing paragraph, I mean. The cycle of the seasons in which poets have so often turned at a reminder that nothing in this world is stable is in fact one of the great constants in life. In some ways, the thousand years or more that have elapsed since the poems in this book were written have changed our world beyond recognition. But every year, when the blossom springs and the leaves fall, we see what the Anglo-Saxon poets saw. The revolving cycle finds us each year at a different moment in the story of our own lives. The unfolding events of history change us, but the seasons do not change. Every year, the familiar sights, words, and stories of the passing seasons will bring forth new fruit for us because every year we bring different things to them and take different things away. So year by year, the cycle may give meaning to the passing of our own brief days and we may become like the winter weathered sage of Maxims II, wise with bygone years. Well, I quite enjoyed it. Who would have thunk poetry? <laughs> oh, the Anglo-Saxon period, as translated, by the way, these translations are new by Eleanor Parker. I'm sure they've been translated many times over the past thousand years or so, more than that, golly. Uh, but uh, these were all translated for the book. Uh, so I think it is um, an absolutely wonderful portal as the Guardian mentioned, a portal back to an older time. So if you are both a poet lover, a poetry lover, and a history lover, and a civilization lover, I think you might enjoy the book. It takes a little bit of textbook uh, tone every once in a while, um, which can be a little too much for me, but uh, then she makes it up with the most beautifully written uh, sections uh, about uh, uh, the period from 450 AD to 1066, where of course everything changed in England with the Norman conquest of France. Anyway, Winters in the World, a journey through the Anglo-Saxon year via the wisdom of poetry, winter, spring, summer, and autumn. I hope you enjoyed parts of it, or all of it. Let me take a few moments here. I think we've gone a bit over time, but it doesn't matter. I couldn't wait to get to summer. <laughs> Let me tell you a little bit about our book next week. August is always that time where you do silly things, you know, so in, uh, loads of people make stacks of books to read at the beach or on the yacht or whatever. Uh, and so I have taken this opportunity to end August uh, with a uh, book that I've never read. Uh, I I had never any interest in it, to tell you the truth. <laughs> and, but I just felt that it is such a significant book uh, that it should uh, be paid attention to somehow, even today. As a matter of fact, let me give you a couple of quotes about the book before I even tell you the title. The San Francisco Chronicle wrote, Electrifying. Well, that's a rather big word in my vocabulary. <laughs> I can't imagine that I've ever used that word, actually. Uh, the New York Times, Big Bad Daddy in New York, the book is not simply the best book on the period. It is the essential book, the pushing, ballooning, ballooning heart of the matter, vibratingly dazzling. Another word I don't use in my vocabulary yet. Newsweek magazine, an American classic that defined a generation. That'll make you wonder, won't it? And finally, the New York Times Book Review says this, an astonishing book 
and an unflinching poet portrait of the author, his merry pranksters, LSD, and the psychedelic 1960s. All right, that should give it away, shouldn't it? Yes, indeed. The name of the book is The Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test by the author Tom Wolfe. Some consider him rather irreligious. <laughs> this was published in 1968. We're talking about the 1960s. One of the most essential works on the 1960s counterculture, Tom Wolfe's The Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test ushered in an era of new journalism. Oh, that struck me as being very curious. The next paragraph, even more so. This is the seminal work on the hippie culture. A report on what it was like to follow along with Ken Kesey and the Merry Pranksters as they launched the, quote, transcontinental bus tour from the West Coast to New York, all the while introducing acid, then legal, huh, to hundreds of like-minded folks, staging impromptu jam sessions, dodging the feds, and meeting some of the most revolutionary figures of the day. Well, the name Timothy Leary does not exist in what I've read, but of course, Timothy Leary started it all at Stanford University. Um, and it was a period of nearly 10 years uh, that drew, uh, first of all, people who at Stanford were willing to uh, go through testing, et cetera, et cetera. But then, of course, well, gosh, a high, and uh, everyone felt great. And then it spread, of course, and it became a period. It became hippie time. And I was most curious in the book to understand, I mean, I was alive and kicking then, but to understand how and why, and then what happened? Imagine one could be arrested then for marijuana, as is in chapter two that I've already read, but one could not be arrested for acid. And it was made into Kool-Aid, just put in Kool-Aid, um, and you just took one slug or a glass or whatever. And so we always think of acid and hippies, so repulsive, hate Ashbury, et cetera, et cetera. I just wanted to go back a little bit and trying to understand why and who, I know where, <laughs> and what happened. Other things came along, didn't it? We never hear about LSD. So I have to agree that it is what I quoted in an earlier book review a couple of weeks ago, A Slice of Life. It is a period, as the New York, New York Times book review says, an astonishing book and an unflinching portrait of Ken Kesey, who is the leader of all of this, very intelligent man, is Mary Prankter's LSD and the Psychedelic 1960s. So if you are a baby boomer like me, maybe you were there, <laughs> maybe you weren't, most likely. Um, and if you have an interest in that period, it just went by while we were doing other things. And it seemed so repulsive uh, to many people. It seemed fabulous, obviously, to some. <laughs> anyway, join me for a very amazing uh, or astonishing or uh, golly, what were the other ones? Uh, ballooning, pushing, essential, vibrating book on a period in history that past. Although you can still go to Boulder, Colorado, and there are still hippies who keep the tradition going. Thank you so much for joining me today. Sorry, we've gone a bit overboard on time, but I did want to get in all of the four seasons. I hope you enjoyed a parts of it if you're a poetry lover and a history lover at the same time. Thank you so much for being with me. Uh, if you did enjoy it, press that uh, thumbs up button, or you may want to send it along to a friend with the sharing button. Or please offer comment. We have that comment section. We're just uh, wrapping up our book uh, list for September and October. So if you have a favorite book you'd like us to read on the program from any genre, any period, any place, we're happy to do that. 
Um, and finally, there's also a place to subscribe. Subscribe sounds like a money-making deal. It isn't. Uh, it's not like a book club, a wine club, or a magazine club. It's simply your email address um, to so that we may send you uh, an occasional update on what's happening at the Camden Public Library in the massive number of programs that we have. It also keeps us in first place. Yes, you must wonder what's first place all about. Well, in the state of Maine, all of the public libraries, small, medium, and large, compete every year to be number one with the highest number of subscribers to this, their uh, YouTube programs channel. Most of the libraries have one. And we have been coming up on two years, I'll still say a year and three quarters, uh, but coming up on two years, we have been in the number one place uh, which is a little hard to believe when you look at our fairly small library. Um, so we are in number one and would like to stay there and we don't like the people breathing down our neck. Uh, so <laughs> help us by simply pressing the subscribe button. If you don't like what we said to you, you can obviously drop out at any time. Thanks again. Enjoy uh, as August unfolds or whenever you uh, listen to this program, enjoy the weeks ahead. I hope you might join me for this strange period in American history um, in which I was alive and well, but oblivious. Take care of yourself. Come again. Thank you very much. Goodbye.